Y'all can read, so I'm not gonna repeat the title. Josh, what is the CLI you're talking about? One of the best things about this channel is that I get to talk about cool stuff that you guys from the community build. The CLI is nothing different. It's a huge time saver. Here we go. So the main thing this CLI does for us is it helps us set up our app. That's what it's for. Once you have a new Next.js application, it can help you set up four things. That is one, TRPC. If you don't know, TRPC is a kind of like API wrapper that makes a type safe to interact between your client and your server. You're gonna see exactly what this means in a second. Essentially, this is useful if you're developing in TypeScript. Then next up is Drizzle. It's like a pure TypeScript alternative to Prisma as your ORM. It tends to be a bit faster, a bit more performant. However, that's not mainly the reason I like to use it. It's just really fun to write because it's very close to the underlying SQL dialect like MySQL or Postgres that you're using. And as you can tell by these testimonials right here, it's really, really good. And anyways, third up is Chat CN UI. It's a modern extensible UI framework. You can build awesome stuff with it. You're gonna see that. And then the last thing I actually forgot while making this graph. So we are gonna take a look at that in the CLI together. First off, it expects a new Next.js application. Again, this is for setting up your app. This is what this CLI is really, really good for. So let's initialize a completely new Next.js app by using the Awesome, Next.js has finished installing and here we are inside of the project. Now setting all this up yourself, of course you can. It will take one or two hours, depending on if you can just copy paste from previous projects or not. With the CLI, it's incredibly easy and takes like two minutes. Let's type in npx kirimase. By the way, I have no idea what this means. Don't ask me, ask the creator. And then let's say init. That's gonna run the CLI and ask us a bunch of questions to make this setup process easier. Like if we're using a source folder, I usually do. I really like it. Hit yes. I use pnpm. It's good for caching. You could use npm just as well. And then we can select which packages we want installed in here, like drizzle as the ORM, trpc, oh, and and that was the fourth one that I missed in the graph. It's auth.js or next auth for a complete user management and authentication. By the way, if I abort this process, let's terminate this batch shop and type in the same thing, but with at latest, it's actually also gonna add the chat CN UI library by default to this. It's gonna ask us the same questions. We can select the same stuff, but now there are four options and just for demonstration purposes, and I would probably also do this in a real scenario. I'm gonna select all of these, choose my SQL, that it's my weapon of choice with planet scale. And it's gonna ask us if we want an example model. Let's hit yes. And that's gonna do a bunch of stuff for us. And then it's gonna ask us which next auth provider because we've chosen that we want. In my case, I'm just gonna go with Google so we can sign in and sign up users using Google. Hit enter and that's gonna install a bunch more stuff. And after answering a bunch more questions for the UI library, it is finally done. Now, what exactly happened? Let's go into the main page in our Next.js project and you're gonna see nothing changed. It's the default page, so what exactly is different? You know what, screw all of that, let's just look at what's new. For example, there's a sign-in component now that was created for us. If we take a look at the implementation, it uses next auth to fetch a session, and if there's no session, we get offered the option to sign in right here with this button. Let's try it out and open this up on our local host 3000. We're gonna see a loading state and then it's gonna say not signed in. Now we're not quite ready to sign in yet. It just won't work. It will offer us the option, but we can't sign in because we haven't set the environment variables yet. Because what the CLI has also done is create a template.env for us. And I just noticed my light in the background just died. I hope you don't mind that. Let's just continue without the light. We need four things that are really important in this .env. The first cell URL is not one of them that is supplied by Vercel if you deploy it there automatically. We need a database URL. We need a next auth secret. This can be anything. This is used to sign your JSON web tokens for authentication, a Google client ID, as well as a Google client secret you get from the Google Cloud Console to allow logging in with Google. I just filled all of my values in. You can get them from your database and from the Google Cloud Console. And let's restart the local host and see if the authentication just works out of the box. Because if it does, it just saved us so much time, right? That would be incredible. Let's click sign in with Google. I'm gonna choose any account of my accounts and then we are already signed in. Wow, this took like five minutes to set up. 
That is really handy, but that's not even the best part. You see, the whole TRPC implementation is also already done for us. Let me show you exactly what this means. In this component, we need to declare this as a client component because TRPC, the library, is purely client side. And then let me show you exactly what it does. If we import TRPC and let's disable GitHub Copilot for this, we can see exactly which API routes we have. And there's one by default that is computers. This is a separate router. This is just like an API endpoint, but in a TRPC syntax, so we get type safety between the client and the server. Essentially, this main app router is just there so we can merge multiple routers. In our case, we only have one, so we could have written it right here as well, but this is a pretty good idea. And as the actual API endpoints, which is nothing else than this right here, it's called the get computers, and it just returns a public procedure. That means anyone can query this endpoint and it returns the result of the function getComputers. If we take a look at this, it just goes ahead into our database, selects everything from a certain table. Again, that's a bit abstract, but let me show you exactly what this does. You can see right here, we can already get in a type safe way, which functions we have in our backend. And we can say dot use query. That means we can make a get request to this endpoint now, and it will automatically make a get request once this page is loaded. It's a very thin type safe wrapper around React query that allows us to just destructure the data from it. What that means is once this page is loaded, this data will be populated with all the computers that are in our database. And with this data, we can do something really, really cool. I want to show you that. Let's wrap this all in a div with a flex, flex dash call, a gap of six and a max width of small just for some minor styling. Let's leave the sign in button as it is and then render out all the data we get type safe from our backend. That means we can see exactly what type in TypeScript this data that we get from our API has. In Next.js by default, that is not possible. For each computer, let's render out the computer.brand just like so and let's also join all the brands together just with a space because they are in array. Save everything and then take a look at how this looks in our page right here. I've already tested this. So we already have two computer entries, which is an Intel i5 and another Intel i5. And this gets even clearer if we separate this with a comma. So you can see each entry as a separate entry right here one and two. And with this type safe implementation all done for us, what we can now do is really easily extend on the logic. That means if we didn't only want to get computers, but also to create new ones, how would we do that in a really clean approach? Well, it's pretty easy. Let's create a new API endpoint called create computer, which everybody, that's what the public procedure here is for, can use. Normally in a real app, you would want this authenticated just for demo. We don't care about authentication for now. You could just write a middleware for that. It's really simple. We expect a certain input. This is like the request body. And we expect a brand property that is of type string for calling this API endpoint. And then as for the actual logic of the endpoint, the mutation is what it's called, the API endpoint business logic. We simply return a create computer output with the input brand, the post request body brand that we pass in, like the Intel i5 string, and then just a hard coded course of five. And if we take a look at this function right here, again, the Postgres stuff won't really work, but instead we can just await the whole operation and then return something like true to indicate the operation was successful, the computer has been created. So how this works is let's add the button that does just that. We are going to do this again with TRPC or type safe way to communicate between client and server in the computer's router. And we're going to call something called create computer and the mutation of it, which is just the function we have literally just implemented together. That's what we're calling here. And we can call that by invoking this create computer function that we can destructure from it. If this succeeds in an unsuccess callback, we are going to do the following. We want to invalidate the data that was queried with the first endpoint because the data that was queried on the page load is no longer valid. We have just added a third computer. Therefore, it should be shown on the page as well. How can we do that? Well, we can import the utils from trpc.useContext. And this gives us access to all our API endpoints. So we can call the utils.computers.getComputer, the endpoint we want to refresh the data for, and then call the invalidate, which is going to force the refreshment of the data. And at the very bottom of the file, let's add a new button that lets us add a computer with a hard coded Intel i5 as the brand, or let's call it 
um, i6 if we wanted to. And then lastly, let's say add a computer inside of the button. Now what that's gonna do is the button is gonna show up and if I click this, we're gonna do two things. First off, create a database entry and second off, refresh this data right here. So let me click that and we can see every time I click it, an Intel i6 is added dynamically that is also being added to our database. We can see exactly what's going on in the network tab. Every time I click this, we can see a create request is being done and also the get request is being redone. So the data is invalidated and refreshed. So it's never stale on our page. Hey, I really hope you enjoyed the video. I got some feedback like a month ago from just a single person, but I really care about your feedback that my videos weren't too beginner friendly. So I made sure to really take the time in this video, explain the concepts behind each tool, how they play together and how much time the CLI is able to save us by setting up these tools. I really hope you enjoy this video. I would love to hear your feedback down below and then I'm gonna see you in the next one. Have a good one and bye bye.